On this show, we compare the best parts of our childhoods and argue which decade was better, the 80s or the 90s. In this episode, we'll be discussing which decade had the best horror movie, the history of 1984 versus 1994, and if the 1980s hairstyle fad, the mullet, would fly today. Which decade was better? You can help us decide. So stick around for this episode of 10 Years Apart. We're going back, 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 way back. It's the 10 Years Apart podcast. 80s versus 90s. With Adam and Scott, Scott, Scott. Welcome to the 10 Years Apart Podcast. Once again, I'm Scott, one of the hosts, and I'm joined by my co-host, Adam. Adam, how's things? Things are going well, thanks. So this podcast is all about comparing our childhood to my childhood was growing up during the 80s and Adam during the 90s, making us 10 years apart. In this episode, we are going to be comparing which decade we thought had the best horror movie. I'll pick my favorite horror movie from the 1980s, and Adam will pick his from the 1990s. Then we'll debate on which horror movie was the best, and you can also vote on which horror movie was your favorite from those decades. You can vote right here if you're watching us on YouTube by clicking on the poll in the top right corner, or you can vote on any of our social media at 10 Years Apart Pod, or by visiting our website at 10yearsapart.com. After we get through our debate on the best horror movie, we'll also have our segment, which we call Does It Fly Today? where we look at a movie, song, or a product from either the 1980s or 1990s and discuss why we think it faded away and if we think it could hold up today. On this episode, we'll be looking back at a 1980s hairstyle, the mullet, and asking, would that fly today? That will be a little later, so stick around for that, too. And before we get into our best horror movie debate, we're going to start off with the first segment, which we call A Year From Our Past. A Year From Our Past. In A Year From Our Past, we'll be doing a brief history look back at a year from each decade and what we remember from those years. So Scott will be looking back at 1984, and I'll be looking at 1994. So I'll get us started with some movies from 1984. Some of the popular movies that came out in that year were Ghostbusters, Footloose, Police Academy, Romancing the Stone, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Gremlins, Beverly Hills Cup, The Karate Kid, Nightmare on Elm Street, Red Dawn, Splash, The NeverEnding Story, Friday the 13th, Revenge of the Nerds, and The Terminator. The best picture for 1984 was Amadeus, and the highest grossing movie from 1984 was The Temple of Doom, with $333 million worldwide. 1994 saw a slew of great films, including True Lies, The Mask, Interview with a Vampire, Four Weddings and a Funeral, The Lion King, Dumb and Dumber, Speed, The Crow, Quiz Show, Forrest Gump, Clerks, Pulp Fiction, and The Shawshank Redemption. The movie that walked away with Best Picture that year was Forrest Gump, and the highest grossing picture was The Lion King, with an almost $764 million gross worldwide. So both decades had great movies. In my opinion, the fourth, you know, the fourth year of any decade seems to have the best movies of all time. So, like, whether it's 74, 84, 94, 2004, I think, you know, just the best movies of all time come out in that year for some reason. I mean, the 80s had, you know, it's the best, I think it's the best year in all cinema. Karate Kid, Ghostbusters, Footloose, Romancing the Stone, Indiana Jones, Splash, movies like that, you know, it was very kid-geared in that year. Which, obviously, I was a kid, so I loved movies like that. The never-ending story I loved. And some of the other movies I didn't see in that year that were kind of more adult-oriented were, like, Police Academy, which is super funny, and I would recommend watching that. Revenge of the Nerds was great. It's the first movie that uh, I think I saw pubic hair in. 
And The Terminator is a classic. I absolutely love that movie. Didn't see it in 84 because I remember seeing it at a friend's house, which meant it was rented. So it was probably after 1986 that I saw that movie, but I thought it was a great movie. And I remember Amadeus actually being good. I don't know if it would have been my top movie that year, but... Obviously, the Indiana Jones movies, like Temple of Doom, was a a great sequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. And movies in 1994 are just as good. I mean, some of my favorite movies, like The Shawshank Redemption is one of my favorite movies. It's in my top five. Like I think I mentioned before that The Last of Mohicans is one of them. But also The Shawshank Redemption is probably one of my favorites and definitely my favorite Stephen King movie of all time. Forrest Gump was good. Don't remember seeing The Lion King that year. It's not a type of movie I would have gone to the theater to see. And Interview of the Vampire was a big one for me because I had read those books by Anne Rice and there's all this hoopla about Tom Cruise playing the vampire list that. But I actually really enjoyed that movie. And for the 1984 movies, I think Ghostbusters was my favorite as a kid. Uh, I probably didn't end up watching it until four or five years after it was released. But I remember watching it on VHS, and once the movie stopped, I would just press rewind and watch it over and over and over again. The Indiana Jones sequel, The Temple of Doom, was a bit terrifying for me, especially when the guy gets his heart ripped out of his chest. Yeah, uh, it was scary for a lot. Yeah, the monkey brains. I mean, yeah, there's brains. a lot of gross aspects in that one. Um Nightmare on Elm Street, I thought, was really good for a horror movie. It had a really good concept, you know, like, don't fall asleep because that's when the villain comes after you. And I think The Terminator was amazing as a film. I think Amadeus is pretty good. You know, I heard it's, like, very historically inaccurate, but I heard, like, you know, aside from that, it's it's pretty entertaining. For the 1994 movies, I think this is probably my favorite year in the 90s for movies. Um, I think Pulp Fiction was groundbreaking in terms of its, like, storytelling, how it just jumps back and forth. Uh, Forrest Gump was, you know, Forrest Gump's always a good watch. I, I, I know some people who don't really care for it, but I think it's a pretty good movie. Shawshank Redemption, anytime I see that on TV, I'll just, I'll stop what I'm doing and watch it. And I think Four Weddings and the Funeral is, you know, really entertaining as like a British comedy. And The Lion King, that's one of those movies that, you know, after I watched horror movies when I was a kid, I would put on The Lion King so that I wouldn't get nightmares that night. Hmm. Yeah, the, the fourth movie of every decade has great movies. I think I agree with you. And in 1984 in music, some of the hit songs that came out were Footloose by Kenny Loggins, Jump by Van Halen, Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr., Dancing in the Dark by Bruce Springsteen, Sunglasses at Night, Corey Hart, which I threw that in because it was a great Canadian song. I Want a New Drug by Huey Lewis and the News, and Legs by ZZ Top. The song of the year from the Billboard Top 100 was When the Doves Cry by Prince, and the Grammy for the song of the year was What's Love Got to Do With It, sung by Tina Turner. Some popular music from 1994 was I'd Do Anything for Love by Meatloaf, the song Crazy by Aerosmith, Shine by Collective Soul, I Swear by All for One, All I Want to Do by Sheryl Crow, and mm, 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 by Crash Test Dummies. Uh, the song of the year, according to the Billboard Top 100, was The Sign by Ace of Bass, and Bruce Springsteen walks away with the best song Grammy for Streets of Philadelphia. And j- almost like movies, I think the fourth year with music has a lot of good tunes in every decade. I remember 1984 because of I was a huge ZZ Top fan. It's the first band that I ever actually joined the fan club. So like back then you had to mail something out and I got, you know, this letter from the fan club and a bumper sticker and all this stuff from ZZ Top. So I remember where I was living at the time and all that type of thing. Van Halen's Jump, that came from the Van Halen album. Of course, it was called 1984 just the show that year and that decade. Wasn't a big Bruce Springsteen fan, but that was a really popular song and video. I think it's the first time you ever got to see Courtney Cox, I believe her name was, from Friends. Mm -hmm. She was uh, the girl in the video. And yeah, a lot of great songs from 1984. The uh, 1994 ones, 
A lot of them I recognize, obviously. They weren't great songs for me because of the music. I, I was into a different type of music in the 90s. But uh, the Meatloaf one was good. Aerosmith became popular again in the 90s because of that song and a few more. I think from uh, his daughter was popular, obviously, at that time. Yeah, the album was Get a Grip. And my take on 1984 music, uh, I recognize a lot of these, but I think what stands out for me is the the Ghostbusters theme by Ray Parker Jr. also came out the same year as I Want a New Drug by Huey Lewis in the News. And they actually had a lawsuit because the song sounds so similar. Uh, Huey Lewis actually sued Ray Parker Jr. Uh, for copyright infringement because he claimed that Parker had stolen the melody and it went to court. Huey Lewis was a great and underrated band. Yeah, I like some of their stuff. I, I didn't become familiar with it until I saw American Psycho. Or did you ever see Back to the Future? Oh, yeah, Back to the Future. They yeah. did all the music in that. The opening song, right? Like, and he was actually, I think he played the principal in the movie. Or okay. Not the principal, but a, maybe a teacher or something. Yeah, I think it may have been one of the talent show judges or something. But Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. And as for the 90s music, uh, the Meatloaf song, I'd Do Anything for Love, I remember going to school dances and being really nervous to dance with a girl to that song. Uh, the Get a Grip Aerosmith album, I really liked the music videos. You know, I think the amazing one was when they, they had like the character in the, in the music video doing virtual reality with uh, Liv Tyler and also Alicia Silverstone were, was in those videos as yeah, well. Yeah, they were both buddies. His yeah. daughter and, yeah, Alicia Silverstone. Did, yeah. a, did a few videos with him, I think. Um, songs like I Swear by All For One. Yeah, if I listen to that now, I could probably it would take me back to this year. All I Want to Do, Sheryl Crow. That was a good album. Yeah, yeah it was a good song. It's pretty catchy. Uh, Ace of Bass was huge. I remember my sister listening to it a lot. I hated them, but, but uh, I remember girls, like preteen girls, really yeah, loved that Yeah, I was surprised band. how big, looking back at it, it was surprising how big they were. They're, they're, so, they're kind of like a band to me, like... Uh, What's that other band? Aqua? Aqua, yeah. Similar, Barbie Girl. Yeah, similar yeah. type. And Ace of Base, they're Swedish, right? Yeah, sure. probably, yeah. Maybe like Ava. Yeah. And The Streets of Philadelphia by Bruce Springsteen. I remember that from the, the film Philadelphia. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Again, a 10 years difference. Bruce Springsteen had some hit songs in both decades. Right. <laughs> And in 1984's TV news and other events, in TV, the MTV Video Music Awards started, and Miami Vice, which was a favorite show of mine, debuted. Some popular toys that were released in the 1984 was Transformers. Some technical breakthroughs in 1984, we had the first Apple Macintosh to go on sale. Genetic fingerprinting or DNA profiling was developed. Sony makes its first three and a half inch computer disc. Sony and Philips introduced the first commercial CD players. And some news and events from 1984. The beauty queen killer was captured and killed in the arrest in the USA. The UK and China agree on Hong Kong. And Hong Kong will revert back to China in 1997, which I think they're having some issues with now. A McDonald's restaurant shooting in California kills 20 people and wounds 16 others. The Summer Olympic Games are held in Los Angeles. And Band-Aid record the song, Do You Know It's Christmas, to help with the Ethiopia famine. Some television events from 1994 include everyone tuning in to watch O.J. Simpson flee police in his white Ford Bronco. Also, ER and Friends debut on NBC, establishing NBC's dominance of the Thursday night lineup. And also in 1994, the Independent Film Channel, or IFC, debuts. Some popular toy releases in 1994 include the Power Rangers toys, which accounted for a billion dollars in sales that year. Some technical breakthroughs from that year was when Dr. Ned first clones calves from cells of early embryos. Also in that year, the FDA approves the Flavor Saver Tomato, the first genetically engineered food product. Some news events from 1994 include the Major League Baseball Players Association beginning a strike causing the 1994 baseball season to be canceled. And Kurt Cobain commits suicide at the age of 27. Thousands are dead in Rwanda massacre or genocide. 
And South Africa holds its first interracial national election, where Nelson Mandela is elected president. And also in 1994, we have Olympic figure skater Nancy Kerrigan bashed in the knee, and three are arrested in the attack. The two things that stick out to me in the 94 year, obviously, was the O.J. Simpson arrest and the whole Bronco chase. I remember being glued to the TV. I think everybody was at that time watching that. And I remember the uh, Nancy Kerrigan thing a lot. And as far as 84 news and events, I don't really remember any of that except for the Band-Aid song. And Miami Vice, obviously, that was a TV show I loved. And toys is interesting because Transformers were such a huge toy and, you know, everybody wanted them and had them. And then in 1994, you had Power Rangers. A little different toy, but I think both came from Asia. Mm -hmm. Two really big toy products that were popular in each decade. Yeah, some things that stick out for me from 1984 in terms of technical breakthroughs, like I think DNA profiling is a big deal. It kind of changed the game for uh, police detectives out there solving murders and things right. like that. Didn't hurt O.J. Simpson in 1994, though. No, it did not, unfortunately. Um, for the news events, I think that uh, China agreeing on Hong Kong, you know, becoming a part of China again, I think, yeah, we, we still see... The effects of that today where we have these huge protests going on in Hong Kong and how they want to remain a democracy. And for 1994, yeah, I remember the O.J. Simpson thing. I didn't know who he was. I mean, I did know who he was from the Naked Gun movies. I didn't realize that he was this, like this all-star athlete. I remember him as Nordberg in the Naked Gun movies. And I was kind of surprised. I thought, that guy? Because he seemed like such a lovable, nice character in the, in the uh, comedy movies. ER and Friends, obviously huge TV shows I never really got into. I was more of a Seinfeld kind of guy. I remember having the Power Rangers toys. Um, they were basically just like big G.I. Joes that wore, you know, almost like motorcycle helmets and funny suits. Yeah, Dr. Ned cloning calves. I mean, Dr. Ned sounds pretty fishy. Yeah. It's a weird name for a doctor. It is strange, yeah. I don't remember the calves. I, I remember... Like the, what was it, the sheep, sheep? or something. Yeah, it was like a sheep named Betty or something that was that cloned. Was first cloned animal, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I do remember Kurt Cobain killing himself. I, you know, I didn't listen to Nirvana. I was too young. But I remember my sister being a bit distraught like, by that because she had a poster of him in her bedroom. Uh, the Rwanda genocide I didn't become familiar with until later on when I was studying political issues in university. But the, apparently that one was brutal because it was used with, you know, Machetes. Machetes. It wasn't like these killing factories that you saw back in World War II. And you know, the Olympic figure skater. I remember a lot of like SNL sketches, seeing like people getting bashed in the knee and, you know, they were kind of making fun of it, but it was actually like pretty brutal. And then that movie that came out, I, Tonya, with Margot Robbie, uh, told, you know, the story from her perspective. It was kind of interesting to see come from her side. The McDonald's shooting, killing 20 people, I don't remember that, but it does show that there's been mass shootings in the U.S. for quite some time. Right. Of course, there are a lot more music, movies, and other news events from both 1984 and 1994, so feel free to let us know about your favorites and your memories from these specific years in the comments below, wherever you find this podcast. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you regarding these years and get your feedback. Now let's move on to the main topic of this episode. It's time for Battle of the Decade. Three, two... One. Battle of the Decade. Fight. I must break you. So for the Battle of the Decade in this episode, and our main topic, we'll be fighting it out on which decade had the best horror movie. Round one. Let's fight. Choose your fighter. All right, for me, the 80s were filled with, you know, it was all horror movies from the 1980s, both good and bad, and there were so many to choose from. So some of the good horror movies that had a bit big effect on me and some honorable mentions were the 1982's The Thing, uh, 1980's Friday the 13th, 1987's Evil Dead 2. I also liked Evil Dead, but Evil Dead 2 was a... Uh, a whole new thing. 1987's Lost Boys and Hellraiser, 1984's Nightmare on Elm Street, and 1980's The Shining. And my first runner-up or honorable mention 
this was almost the movie that I chose because it had such a big effect on me when I was a kid and scared the shit out of me, was 1981's American Werewolf in London. But my final choice for the best horror movie of the 1980s, the one that scared me the most out of all of these movies when I first saw it, it came out in the year 1982, and my choice is Poltergeist. So the 1990s was a great decade for movies of all genres. And for the horror genre, we see such great films as The Blair Witch Project, which gave birth to the found footage genre, scared the hell out of people who first saw it. And a lot of people thought it was a true story. Uh, We have Ringu and The Ring. So the Japanese version is amazing. And even though an inferior American remake drew a wider audience, people realized that Japanese horror was really terrifying and should be appreciated more by fans of the horror genre. We also have the movie Scream, which marks perhaps the most personal and reflective of all the slasher films and represents a major turn towards big budget horror as a place for burgeoning auteurs to hone their craft. Uh, Some more honorable mentions that I consider to have elements of horror but are essentially thriller movies include Silence of the Lambs, Seven, the original Funny Games, and Ravenous. But my choice for the best horror film of the 1990s is Jacob's Ladder, which was released in 1990. Round two. Let's fight. Tell the tape. Some reasons why I chose Poltergeist was that it was directed by Toby Hooper, who was famous for directing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I believe was in 1974. It is one of my favorite horror movies of all times. And it was also written and, dir- and produced by Steven Spielberg. Poltergeist made common household things you would find in any family's home terrifying, like thunderstorms, trees, a clown doll, and white noise or snow on a TV when the channel goes off the air. It had a great cast and a family that made everything believable in the movie. It was made on a budget of just $10.7 million and brought in almost $122 million at the box office. It was so good that they even tried to do a remake of it recently. Even though that had some good moments, it wasn't close to being as good as the original. Poltergeist still holds up today with some of the scariest scenes ever in horror to be put on the camera. It's the only scary movie from the 80s that still gives me the creeps looking back at it and the impact that it had on me after seeing it. Okay, and my choice for best horror movie of the decade was Jacob's Ladder, a 1990 American psychological horror film directed by Adrian Lin, produced by Alan Marshall, written by Bruce Joel Rubin, and starring Tim Robbins, Elizabeth Pena, and Danny Aiello. The film's protagonist, Jacob, is a Vietnam War veteran whose experiences prior to and during the war result in strange, fragmentary visions and bizarre hallucinations that continue to haunt him. As his ordeal worsens, Jacob desperately attempts to figure out the truth. The reason why I chose this film is because it steered the horror genre into a direction that wasn't just related to spooky images or creepy stalker slasher flicks. I hate to use this term that's being thrown around today that is quote-unquote elevated horror because it demeans some classic horror movies of the past. But Jacob's Ladder stood out because it told us some of the most unsettling thoughts and imagery can come from the mind itself. I think this has paved the way for horror films that make you think, for example, Session 9, In the Mouth of Madness, Black Swan, The Babadook, Hereditary, and The Witch. Some other reasons why I chose Jacob's Ladder is because it delves into the mind, shows you how internal forces can make the story frightening, and this is much scarier than the thing that terrifies you that doesn't come from some external entity, but from within. Uh, These are horror films that people talk about and think about long after they are viewed. Some horror from the past was watched and then kind of scrubbed from the mind, but these films like Jacob's Ladder, you talk about them with your friend or the person you watched it with, and uh, it has more great. It has a greater artistic merit in terms of storytelling. Round three. Let's fight. Counterattack. All right, I kind of remember seeing Jacob's Ladder. Not sure what age when I saw it. 
But it wasn't in 1990 because I had rented it for the first time when I saw it. So it probably would have been a year or two afterwards. The key thing there is I kind of remember it. I remember it having a few scare, scary images maybe, but uh, I don't remember it being a scary movie. In fact, I don't even remember anything about the movie. Whereas Poltergeist, I can remember almost everything about it. You mentioned psychological horror sticks with you, but uh, I don't remember much about Jacob's Ladder at all. And that sounds more like it would be a better movie to watch as an adult to understand it and just sounds complicated. Poltergeist was made for a wide range of ages to understand and psychologically speaking scared me more. It made it hard for me to sleep at night and carried on with me into my teens and even into my adulthood. Jacob's Ladder cost over twice the budget as Poltergeist with about $25 million, but it only made $26 million at the box office. Doesn't mean it was a bad movie or a good movie, but it does mean that not many people went to see it and the word of mouth wasn't that great, unlike Poltergeist. And Jacob's Ladder, by all means, was a box office bomb. And my thoughts and opinions of Poltergeist, as you mentioned, it was directed by Toby Hooper. However, I heard that down the line he kind of lost a lot of artistic control over it. And there was even an article in the news that came out, or in the newspaper, that said that Steven Spielberg was secretly directing Poltergeist. Yeah, it had, it was very, it was a very Steven Spielberg-like movie. Yeah, and I think that if they had, if they had given Toby Hooper a lot more artistic freedom, I probably would appreciate it more as a horror movie, because I do love Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well, and I think that movie is terrifying than both of these films combined. Um, I think Poltergeist is good for kids, it's scary for kids, but I think I think if I watched it now, I don't think it would scare me very much. Uh, You'd be surprised. Try it. I might. Yeah, maybe I'll revisit it because you chose it. I think I'll revisit it for that for that reason alone, and I'll let you know maybe in a future episode what I thought. Did you see the remake? I did not because I heard it was not very good. Yeah. Round four. Let's fight. Final round. And for the final round, again, why I chose Poltergeist from the 1980s in a decade that gave us so many horror legend creatures and monsters like Jason Voorhees, Pinhead, and Freddy Krueger. As a kid, I didn't really relate to them and didn't have bad dreams about them after watching those movies. However, Poltergeist made a toy clown, which was a toy that I actually had. Terrifying. And counting the gap between lightning and thunder and a tree banging against my window, which happened to me, was uh, just had a quite a, it had a lot of sleepless nights for me because of that. And the snow, you know, off the air signal that was on TVs most of the time when channels went off the air was kind of unbearable to me after watching this movie. Like if I fell asleep and woke up and the channel had gone off the air and it was just that snow on the TV, I had to turn it off right away. The family and the characters or the actors in the movie were great. It made the movie feel believable. Like it was a really, you know, it felt like it was a real family. Spielberg gave it his touch. Like you said, maybe he ended up directing it in the end, which I don't think is a bad thing because he's a legend. I think it would have been something different if it was a rated R movie. You know, it might have been scarier watching it later on as an adult, but I would not have seen it when I did, which had a bigger effect on me at that time. And I think even now, whenever I hear a thunderstorm or see white noise on TV screens, it kind of gives me the chills. It scared me the most as a child in the 80s out of all the horror movies that came out during that time. You know, I saw a lot of, obviously I saw a lot of horror movies in the 80s, especially the late 80s, but Poltergeist just scared the shit out of me and stuck with me. And that's why I think Poltergeist is the best horror movie of the 1980s. And some of my final thoughts on Jacob's Ladder. Um, I think, like as I mentioned before, psychological horror sticks with the viewer more. I think it has greater artistic merit in terms of storytelling. Not to take away f- credit from any of the other horror films, I think practical effects in some of them are very innovative and impressive, particularly with regards to things like American Werewolf in London. I mean, some of the practical effects in that are just, you know, outstanding. 
The ending of Jacob's Ladder has that kind of twist that you don't really see coming, and the way it pulls it, that off in and of itself warrants its credibility as a classic horror movie. And uh, it's a central pillar of the modern psychological horror film, Jacob's Ladder. Uh, it holds up today as an entertaining, disturbing film, and it has various meanings that can be discussed and argued between critics and viewers alike for the years to come. And also it brings kind of a dreamlike atmosphere to the horror genre, which I think we hadn't really seen in movies prior to this, aside from, you know, the obvious Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. And those are the reasons why I chose Jacob's Ladder as the best horror movie of the 1990s. So which horror movie do you think was the best from which decade? Was it Poltergeist from 1982 or was it Jacob's Ladder from 1990? Remember, you can vote on which of these horror movies you thought was better in the poll in the above top right corner here on YouTube or any of social media at 10 Years Apart Pod or at our website 10yearsapart.com. And finally, on this episode of 10 Years Apart, we're going back to look at a 1980s hairstyle fad that was known as the mullet. Can it make a comeback? Why did it fade away? It's time for Would That Fly Today. Would That Fly Today? The mullet, a hairstyle that was around in other decades, but most popular in the 1980s. Business in the front, party in the back. Adam, do you remember the mullet? I remember my cousins and some of my friends having mullets when I was very young. Uh, I've never had one myself. I thought they looked kind of silly. Uh, my opinion has not really changed of them. I know they kind of uh, made a comeback when I was in high school. Some people grew them out, like, ironically, to be funny. Uh, I don't think I'd ever grow on myself. I, th I just think they really look kind of stupid. And Scott, do you remember the mullet? Uh, of course I remember this hairstyle, and I had one myself. They weren't known as the mullet to us at that time or any other name. They were just kind of the hairstyle that most people had. We knew it as hockey hair, maybe at that time or later on, and remember it as most hockey players had it, and uh, most of my hockey team had that hairstyle. Not everybody, but I had it. Quite a few other guys on my team had it. So yeah, I remember the mullet. What are some of the reasons do you think the mullet faded away? Uh, let's be real. I think it's an ugly haircut for men. Uh, even guys who try to grow one out ironically, it just kind of looks stupid. You know, business in the front, party in the back. No, business in the front and back or party in the front and back. Can't have it both ways. That's why I think the mullet faded away. How about you? Uh, I think it died off with, you know, when long hair for guys kind of in general died off and like the metal years died away or hair metal died. And grunge came in in the 1990s. You didn't see too much of the mullet around after that. Shorter hair became more manageable. It kind of gave you the older look and a cleaner look. Shorter hair was easier in the end to wear under helmets, actually, in hockey. So it was a uh, kind of killed the hockey hair thing. It was just kind of a nuisance at the end of the day. When long hair died with guys the mullet or hockey hair died with it. So do you think the mullet can make a comeback today? No, I don't think so. I think that the mullet is dead, and I don't want it to be revived, to be frank. How about you? Do you think that the mullet could fly today? Uh, no. I think it won't become common and popular again today because it's just got this negative stereotype to it. It has a stereotype of, you know, it makes you kind of look less intelligent or even on the poorer class, like trailer trash and kind of dirty, like movies like, uh, was it Joe Dirt? Joe Dirt, yeah. Kind of trailer trashy is associated with the hockey hair or the mullet now. So because of that, I just don't see it becoming popular or something you'd want to have. I would like to see it make a comeback and I would grow a mullet again if I could, but no, it wouldn't fly today. Also, give us your feedback on the mullet in the comments below. You can also share us your memories of mullets on our social media at 10 Years Apart Pod or on our website at 10yearsapart.com. The mullet. Did you have one? Would they fly today? No. <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode of 10 Years Apart. Thanks for listening, and you can now help us out by helping us decide which decade had the best horror movie. 
Just head over to our website at 10 years apart or any of our social media at 10 years apart pod and vote right now. Leave us your comments and thoughts below wherever you find this podcast. Join us again next week when we talk about which decade had the best action figures. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or anywhere you find podcasts so you never miss an episode. If you came across this episode and enjoyed it, please hit that like button, subscribe to us here on YouTube for the latest videos, and don't forget to share. Sharing really helps us out. And once again, find us at 10yearsapart.com or any social media at 10 Years Apart Pod. Stop by, vote, and let us know some of your stories from the 80s or the 90s. Remember to like, subscribe, share, and leave us your comments wherever you found this episode. And thanks again for tuning into the past with us here on 10 Years Apart. Hit that thumbs up button below if you like this video of 10 Years Apart. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more episodes on the 80s and 90s. Vote on this episode's main topic in the top right corner or at 10yearsapart.com. Leave us your comments on the 80s or 90s. We love hearing from you. Plus, get more great videos like this video right here. Like, subscribe, share, and thanks for watching 10 Years Apart. Bye.